One major obstacle for neophyte growers is in understanding the diversity of cultural requirements of various genera of orchids. Orchids are such a vast group of plants which have succeeded in nearly every conceivable habitat on Earth that knowledge of a specific genus cultural requirement, rather than general knowledge of what orchids like, is necessary to successfully cultivate the various types. Most orchids that we are cultivating in our private collections come from tropical regions, but differences in elevation and other geographic features of their native habitats can mean dramatic differences in the response of orchids to various external conditions. Most emphatically, these differences can be seen in the different genera's toleration of cold. While some orchids are native to regions where frost is more the norm than the exception, others are hypertropical plants for whom 10 degrees Celsius is far too cool. Knowing which is which is essential in a mixed collection of orchids. And a great irony for beginners is to discover that their extra nurturing efforts to protect certain orchids have in fact done more harm than good. In this video, I'm going to do an in general cover of how cold tolerant our orchids can be, dividing the information up for different genera. The key word being general, and when it comes to hybrids, things may change yet again, depending on the parentage. However, I hope that the following general overview will be helpful and result in specific questions in the comments so that any doubts you may have can and will be cleared up. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for your time. Now, let's talk. How cold can you grow? Let's start with the genus Dendrobians, which, in my opinion, can be the most confusing for new orchid growers. This huge genus, well over a thousand species, divided into 15 sections, ranges over nearly a quarter of the planet. Found from Western India all the way to Micronesia, Dendrobiums inhabit an incredible variety of ecological niches. Ironically, the two sections most common in horticulture are diametrically opposite in cold tolerance. Section Dendrobium, the soft bulb or nobly types, whether in their pendulous forms like Dendrobium anosmen and a film, or in the upright types like Dendrobium nobly and its hybrids, positively relish the cold. Temperatures right down to frost are the best culture to produce the most prolific bloomings of these plants. Without cold and drought stress in winter, these plants will retain their leaves and produce an abundance of vegetative growth, but few, if any, flowers. Stressed by cold and dried out properly, these plants lose all their leaves, and in spring the bare bulbs are covered in blooms. Let me add an exception to that. <laughs> We're talking about the nobly complex hybrids and some nobly species. These are not deciduous until much, much later in the age of their canes. The opposite is true for the hard cane dendrobiums of the section Spathula and Phalanothe. Loss of leaf on Dendrobium phalaenopsis types is usually indicative that they have suffered from too much cold. Temperatures below 15 degrees Celsius can produce this undesirable effect. Dendrobium phalaenopsis and evergreen types should receive maximum cold protection. They are warm to hot growers and object to cold temperatures very, very quickly. They are definitely not temperature tolerant, and for that reason, since I stopped heating my grow space, I do not grow Dendrobium phalaenopsis anymore because my temperatures indoors will dip down to 14 degrees Celsius, and anything below 20 degrees, they will tell you straight away, no bueno. Even though I previously mentioned 15 degrees Celsius, that is the absolute low that you should never ever reach when it comes to Dendrobium phalaenopsis. So I prefer to put a medium margin, a safe zone of do not go below 20 degrees Celsius when it comes to denfals. And you will have some gorgeous and very, very floriferous denfals if you keep them nice, toasty and warm. Other sections of the Dendrobium genus have slightly different tolerances. Section Calista, which include Dendrobium farmeri, Dendrobium lindleyi, also known as Dendrobium aggregatum, and their relatives can take temperatures nearly as low as the nobly types and will bloom all the better when exposed to temperatures as low as between 3 and 5 degrees Celsius. 
Section Formosae, examples of which are Dendrobium formosum and Dendrobium infundibulum, and the new hybrids prefer slightly warmer conditions but are quite happy with temperatures between 6 degrees Celsius and 9 degrees Celsius. Other sections of dendrobiums in cultivation, such as Pedilonium and Latoria, and the Australian hybrids of section Dendrocorn, have slightly different requirements, and those growing these more exotic types of dendrobiums will succeed best in researching them. Or you are welcome to just ask me in the comments, and I will be able to specify what is best for these dendrobiums if you have any in your collection and are in doubt. After the cold-sensitive hard cane dendrobiums, I consider the Phalaenopsis genus to be the most tender of commonly grown orchids. Phalaenopsis will be strongly induced to bloom by temperatures around 13 degrees Celsius. A few exposures to temperatures below 15 will produce the desired spikes, and hereafter, the plants will be happiest if they are kept above 15 degrees Celsius. One or two nights down to 10 degrees Celsius or slightly below will do little harm, but uh, <laughs> that is to be avoided in the best kept collection. So what I want to point out with these temperature requirements is that we are talking about complex hybrids, the kinds that you can get in the big box stores or your supermarket. When it comes to species Phalaenopsis, especially the summer bloomers, ideally you do not want to have them endure temperatures below 20 degrees Celsius ever. I do grow summer blooming fowls, but I have lost many because of my winter conditions, so I am not going to say that they are temperature tolerant for an extended period of time. I am discovering that some may be, but it will take another couple of winters to see how robust the ones I have left are before I give you any definitive summer blooming fowls that are more forgiving. Even if they can survive the low temperatures, the chances of their leaves struggling and getting cell damage is extremely high, so keep watching the space because while I hate losing orchids, I am able to give you solid feedback as to the performance or the lack thereof of summer blooming fowls that have to deal with temperatures below 20 degrees Celsius as well as minimal access to light. Which segs beautifully into me asking you to please subscribe to the channel if you have not already done so. I appreciate your support in that way very much. And while you are in that area subscribing, the like button is very close by. So hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Thank you so much. Every little helps for YouTube to recognize that this video is worth recommending. And just know that I appreciate you for being the catalyst to make that happen. Next up on my list is the beautiful genus of Vandas. In my opinion, Vandas come next to the scale of sensitivity. Like Phalaenopsis, they are stimulated to bloom with sharp drops of temperature down to 15 degrees Celsius at night, especially when the temperature can be induced to climb all the way back up to 27 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius during the day. Vandas will tolerate brief excursions as low as 10 degrees Celsius, but are best kept around or above 15 degrees Celsius. Temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius for very long or very often will result in leaf loss, turning the plants into palm trees. Now, here we have another exception because of the reclassification of Neophoenicias to Vandas. Vanda falcata can easily tolerate temperatures as low as 5 degrees Celsius and lower in many cases because of where they grow in their natural habitat. Back in the day when they were classified as Neophoenicias, this exception to the subject of Vanda temperature tolerance would not have needed to be mentioned. However, now that they are classified as Vandas, it must be stated that they are the exception to the general rule of Vanda's lack of temperature tolerance. Just an FYI, I have found that Vandas of the Tourette type are super temperature tolerant because my Vanda Chalpraya has to deal with temperatures as low as 5 degrees Celsius. While it would appreciate less stress for sure, the fact that it can handle the low temperatures over an extended period of time without the day temperatures rising to 27 degrees Celsius or higher is a testament that if you don't have space indoors for such a large vanda, you can cultivate this type of vanda outdoors if your outdoor conditions are similar to mine. Then we have another genus or a huge genus alliance which covers all types of oncidiums. 
Oncidiums of the mule ear type with the thick fleshy leaves like Oncidium loridum or Lancianum, etc., have warmth requirements similar to Vanda's. The thinner leaved Oncidine will usually take temperatures down to 5 degrees Celsius with no risk to life or structure. Many of the hybrids in this group have been bred with Miltonioxus and Odontoglossum, which increases their cold tolerance. A caution with this group is the ability of wind to strip heat rapidly from their thin leaves, so the cold tolerance of these will be much greater in still air. While the leaves may show signs of stress, maybe for an extended period of time of super cold, maybe some leaves tip will burn. But if you happen to run out of space indoors and once again your temperatures outdoors hover around the 5 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius as the average low, then many oncidiums will be just fine. Now, with the exception of some species of Amazonian origin, like Cattleya violacea, most Cattleyas can take quite cool temperatures. Most growers have few concerns for them even in temperatures down to 9 degrees Celsius. They must, however, be protected from both frost and freeze. In the event that you've got your Cattleyas outside and are wondering, just be extra cautious on those clear still nights should the temperatures drop down to 3 degrees Celsius. You might at that point want to bring the Cattleyas inside, but generally they should be fine around the 9 degrees Celsius mark. So far mine are doing great, but I do have them protected in the blooming alley. It's a little bit closer to the building and it is surrounded by curtains, just a little bit more protected than if they were just bang out in the middle of the patio. So while we were talking about the cold, certain other genera from the high Himalayas, such as deciduous calanthi, blatias, and cymbidium species and hybrids actually require quite cold temperatures to stimulate them to their best bloom. Even the warm growing, temperature tolerant hybrid cymbidium Videos, they flower best when chilled repeatedly as low as 5 degrees Celsius. Keep in mind that all orchids tolerate cold best when they have proper nutrition. Avoid too much nitrogen, which might stimulate too soft growths, and focus on calcium while the structures of your orchids are in active growth. This will ensure strong cells and cell walls, which will withstand the colder temperatures much better. You can also increase the dosage and frequency of both magnesium and potassium in colder weather. Magnesium will help with photosynthesis in the event that you are not using supplemental lights for as long as your orchids would have during the longer day lengths of the year. And potassium helps your orchids deal with stresses specifically associated with temperatures not being ideal, as well as any possible diseases from getting a chance to take hold and possible threats of pests enjoying the indoor-outdoor environment while the outdoors is too hostile for them. And that is a reference to what I'm doing here because I do shuffle my orchids outdoors during the sunny days and pests will attach to them nicely so that they can be all nice toasty and warm in the indoor growth space before it's time to go outside again. <laughs> Do not think that just because it is winter and you may have your orchids outside that pests are not going to go for them because the great outdoors for the most part in the northern hemisphere this time of year is fast asleep. So there's not much to feed on except for our beautiful orchids. <laughs> And our orchids don't just stay as a temptation for the pests, they are the target. Now, depending on how you are cultivating your orchids, be it in organic or inorganic media, the first parts of the orchid that may show signs of stress, as in the temperatures were too low, are signs of anthocyanin on some orchid leaves or watery looking cells on the leaves, which will eventually turn yellow and soft, if not dealt with as a matter of urgency. And if that is not the case, because the structures are tough and could take the adverse conditions because that is what they are used to out in nature, then the root system may fail because it was too wet for too long and with water, an additional cool cooling effect is induced. Now, you will have noticed that my potted orchids are in lecker and self-watering for the most part, so yes, the root systems of my orchids are constantly in a damp environment. I do not let the pots dry out and they will be cold because not only water stays cool, lecker has evaporative cooling which drops the temperature even further. 
How am I able to get the root systems through the cold temperatures while wet? If a wet dry cycle culture will take out roots in the event that the pot is wet for too long? Well, I have lost orchids due to the evaporative cooling effect. And if I have not lost orchids to that, I certainly have lost entire root systems. So in my case, it is a question of trial and error and understanding which orchids in my collection are even more resilient compared to others. Besides, those orchids that maintain their root system during the cold months of the year, their velamen is adapted to a damp environment and to think that letting them go dry while the orchid is subjected to low temperatures would be the end of that root system as the leka will start to pull any moisture out of the root system as well if the leka is allowed to go dry. So in a semi-hydroponic setup, the root system is never allowed to go bone dry no matter the temperature. Compare that to the wet-dry cycle. Root systems in a wet-dry cycle have developed velamen to grow and harden off because the roots are allowed to dry out between waterings. If the root system of orchids in that kind of culture is then wet for too long, the hardened velamen cannot cope with the conditions of being damp for too long and for that reason, that root system will rot and fail. As mentioned, this was a general overview of the cold temperature tolerance of our orchids and I hope that you have peace of mind in the event of unexpected temperature drops within your home that your orchids are hardier than you may have thought. Or if something goes wrong in the greenhouse and needs a couple of days to fix, for the most part, your orchids are going to be fine and if you have any questions and want to bring a specific case to my attention, please do not be shy and let's talk about it in the comments. I hope that this video was helpful. It could be that you're watching this video and it is the first time you're dealing with winter for your orchids, so I'm hoping that the information I provided here gives you peace of mind. I do look forward to hearing from you in the comments. In the meantime, let me thank you for watching the video and love and leave you with wishing you a beautiful day on that one condition that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.